Good morning, and welcome to worship here at First Presbyterian Church of Effingham. We are so grateful that you have decided to join us this morning. A few announcements before we get started. If you have not turned in any fabric prayers, we would welcome those. We are looking for any of the prayers that you might have. Just write those down on random scraps of fabric and return them to the church office. You can leave them in the mailbox or the bucket by the front door. We even have some extra scraps of fabric by the door in the bucket in case you need some to write your prayers down. There's no limit to how many you can turn in. You can do this as many times as you want. All of your prayers are welcome. Also, if you haven't turned in any recipes for our new cookbook, I would invite you to email those to me and or the church office so that those might get included. Any recipe that is special to your family or that you just particularly enjoy, please send those in so that we might all enjoy those together. Now, let us worship the living and triune God. Let us pray. When we dream, we dream of children who know love and churches with open doors. We dream of rest and sunny days. We dream of peace without walls and equality for all people. We dream of milk and honey, food on tables, and an end to suffering. We dream of the Church of Jesus Christ serving all God's people. Family of God, this morning we dream together. This morning we worship together. For there is nothing on heaven or on earth strong enough to unravel God's dreams for us. Gracious God, we do not know the plans you have for us. We do not know, so we place our children in the best schools. We set aside money for days to come. We keep our fingers crossed and try to control the world around us. Having faith in the midst of uncertainty has never been easy for us. Forgive us for the moments when we refuse to trust you. Strengthen us so that when life unravels, we are strong enough to turn to you. That is our prayer of faith. Amen. For our call to worship, Please join in the refrain, God is here. No matter where we are, may we know God is near because God is here. In our homes or in the hospital, in our neighborhood streets and grocery store aisles, may God's presence surprise us because God is here. When we stay home in sweatpants all day, anxious to get back to normal, but afraid of what that will be. May God's presence comfort us because God is here. When we work and are faced with new challenges or the same struggles made even more complicated, it's heartbreaking. May God's love empower us because God is here when we just can't take any more. May God's presence give us just one deep breath. When we catch a glimpse of a holy fire, may we fall to our knees because God is here.
Our scripture reading for today is Exodus chapter 1, verse 22, and chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Listen now for the word of God. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. Every Hebrew boy that is born you must throw into the Nile, but let every girl live. Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could no longer, when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the river bank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. When the baby grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. This is the word of God. Amen. Let us pray. God of unending surprises, this life is a tapestry of moments woven together, and we long to be weavers of love. Today we gather and pray that you would unravel our bias, unravel our assumptions, unravel whatever it is that keeps us from you. And as you do, clear space in our hearts for your word. We are listening. We are praying. Amen. Quite often when we look at scripture, it is easy to see God at work. We look at stories of Jesus at work and we can easily point to the divine acts of a savior. We see God speaking to people through burning bushes or causing storms or even having whole fish swallow up people. But then there are times when God's work is not on display in obvious ways. Sometimes when we look at scripture, we can look at and see God at work through the actions of people. For instance, in the entire book of Esther, God is not mentioned one time, but there are still plenty of ways that we can see God is indeed at work, especially when God works by using people to do the things that God has called them to do. Our scripture for today is no different. And in order for us to fully understand the scripture we heard, we, we need to understand the history and the context. What has caused this woman, a slave, to put her son in a basket and send him down crocodile-infested waters? What causes a mother to be so desperate as to have no choice but to do this? It has been about 400 years since we last we left Joseph inviting his brothers and their families to come and live with him down in Egypt, where because of Joseph's preeminence, the Hebrew tribes enjoyed all of the privileged benefits of honored guests. They were welcomed with open arms. A lot has happened during that time, and the author of Exodus takes us only a few short verses to remind us. A new king is now on the throne in Egypt. A king who did not know Joseph, meaning a king who had no commitment to the descendants of Joseph, at least not anything like Joseph's original boss had had, and no genuine concern for their welfare. To make things even more tense, the original family of Jacob was a family of 70, had grown by leaps and bounds during their stay in Egypt so that the land was filled with them. More numerous even than we are, the Pharaoh noticed, and more powerful too. It's important to remember that Egypt had not exactly had a peaceful time of it during these centuries. 
Foreign invaders had occupied the eastern part of the empire for some time, forcing Egypt to take a more warlike stance than usual, protecting their borders, conscripting captured invaders into forced labor camps. In such a highly charged situation, the presence of an ever-growing Hebrew population as well was just simply more of a threat than Pharaoh had on his mind. Pharaoh saw the Hebrew people as a threat to his security. That is why the Hebrews became slaves in the land of Egypt, because the new king of Egypt saw it as a way to keep them in their place. Better to have them in chains, the new boss man said, than joining up with our enemies. Like most of the plans of tyrants, however, Pharaoh's plan backfired in spades. But they were more oppressed. The more they multiplied and spread, so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites, you hear. Until finally, Pharaoh started to feel like he was trying to hold back an explosion of people. Pharaoh comes up with this brilliant plan, or so it seemed to him at the time, of cutting off the explosion in numbers. He approaches two women who would have been appointed as midwives to all of the thousands of Hebrew women. Yes, two midwives for all of the Hebrew women and says to them, I want you to start killing off all of the boys of the Hebrews whenever you get a chance. Whenever a baby boy is born, just kill him. But the two midwives, and we know their names are Shifra and Pua, don't want to follow the plan. Instead, they risk their lives and tell the Pharaoh, whom we believe to be Ramses II, that they just simply don't make it in time to the births of the Hebrew children. They make the excuse that the women are just having the babies before they even get there, so they can't kill them. And so Pharaoh, a little annoyed, he comes up with this new plan. He thought that since the first plan didn't work, he needed a foolproof plan. So Pharaoh decides to instruct his own people to take every Hebrew baby boy and to drown them in the Nile. Every single baby boy. And so to avoid being drowned, Moses was born and put in a straw basket and sent down the Nile River. Miriam, the older sister of Moses, followed the basket down the river until the baby basket ran into some women bathing in the river. One of the women was Pharaoh's own daughter. Imagine the shock and fear as Miriam watches her little brother be plucked from the reeds by the very family of people that they are trying to protect this fragile baby from. But Pharaoh's daughter has a softer heart. She pulls the baby out and sees Miriam in the bushes. She calls to her and tells her to go and find some nursemaid to nurse this baby. Of course, Miriam goes and gets their own mother named Jochebed. And now the Hebrew woman is on the Pharaoh's payroll being paid to nurse her own baby the very baby she was trying to protect of the tyrannical Pharaoh. So in the end, Pharaoh ends up protecting, raising and educating the very Hebrew boy child who is going to make him sorry that he ever heard of the Hebrews and without a clue that he is doing it. Can you imagine what it must have been like going through Jacob's mind as she pressed the tar and the mud into the grass with the basket she wove? Can you imagine the ache from her belly having just given birth? The cries of Moses calling the milk to fill up and poor Jochebed. Jochebed has two older children already. Miriam, who is about seven, and Aaron, who is only three. She has a family. This was surely a child that they had prayed for. Jochebed felt every kick from the growing Moses. She and her, her husband rejoiced as Jochebed's belly swole with new life. And yet, she has no choice but to place her son in this basket and pray. Did she know that the Pharaoh's daughter would rescue the baby? Did she pray that someone would find him and keep him safe? Did she assume his fate was sealed and this was just a last-ditch effort? Who knows? But either way, the mother can't stand to not know what happens to her baby. So she sends her daughter to follow the baby down the river. 
I can imagine Jochebed pacing the floor of her house, wringing her hands, waiting on Miriam to come back with word about the newborn. I imagine Jochebed hearing Miriam screaming, Mom! Mom! and having the sinking feeling in the pit of her stomach as Miriam comes rushing in. I'm sure she's cautiously relieved when she hears she has been summoned to care for the baby in Pharaoh's court. But the sting is still real. This will not be her baby anymore. She will feed this child. She will bathe him. She will care for him. But she will not be called mom. None of this would be how Jochebed imagined her family would unfold. None of this was in the plans she had made for her child, but still she takes the sacrifice of giving up what she planned for her family to ensure that her child has life. She gives up her comfort and her wishes to give this child a way to have a life. And we know the rest of the story, don't we? We know how Moses grows to be a man who cares deeply for all people. Moses is called upon by God to lead the Israelites to freedom and works to set up the earliest days of what it meant to be a community of faith. Jochebed's sacrifice is what sets this all in motion. You see, even though we don't hear the name of God mentioned in this text, God is surely present. God uses Jochebed's sacrifice to set a nation free. God uses the pain and suffering to bring new life, literally a new baby, out of the darkness of genocide. It's Jochebed's actions that can only be explained as being godlike or inspired by God's love. You see, here's the kicker. This story is largely about people who were without power, making sacrifices and taking risks. First is the midwives, Shepra and Puah. They had orders from Pharaoh, but instead chose to lie to protect the innocent babies. They had no authority. They could have been killed for their cover story, but instead they chose to risk their lives to protect those of innocent babies. And then there's Jochebed. She is just a Hebrew woman, a slave. She has no authority in this land. She risked everything to try to give her child a life. And then there's Miriam, the sister. She is also a child, a slave child. Had she been found in the reed, she could have been killed too. But she risked everything to watch over her baby brother, hoping to guide him to safety. And finally, there is the Pharaoh's daughter, Although she is part of the royal family, she is still a woman. Her voice is not considered as important as the males in her family. Her opinion would be quickly dismissed. Still, she is moved to compassion and bravery to take this child and raise him as her own without giving his secrets away. All of these people sacrificed something in what they had planned for their lives in order to protect people who did not have a voice. All of these people love sacrificially for the sake of humanity, and if it's not God at work, I just don't know what it is. Recently, we've all experienced what it means to give up on plans that we had made. We have families giving in birth in the hospital with no family present, funerals limited to 10 people, weddings postponed, and graduations just canceled. We've all been called to sacrifice something. The reality is our sacrifice may not seem as big. None of us are shipping our children down rivers to avoid genocide, at least not in this country, but our sacrifices are no less important. We have isolated ourselves physically from others as an act of compassion for the weaker. We isolated to give doctors a chance to help those in need and to protect those that are vulnerable. We wear masks, not because we like a new fashion statement, but because it is another way for us to help protect our brothers and sisters. Truly, when we think about our sacrifice compared to that of Jochebed, our sacrifices don't seem like such a big deal at all. God is at work in our sacrifices. God is the God that loved us so much that he sacrifices his own son for our victory over death. God understands what sacrifice is. Yet so much has been said lately for protecting our personal rights over the sacrifice of caring for the vulnerable. I think 
that is human for us to tighten our grip on what we have and hold on tight to what we know and value. We want what is ours. But what if we change our mindset? What if we start to think like Shifra and Pua, Jochebed, Miriam, and the Pharaoh's daughter? What if we start caring for others with the same sacrificial love? What if we start to think more God-like? What might that look like? What might it look like to put the needs of others over our own individual needs? This sort of sacrificial love does not come without a risk. Just like in our scripture, there is always a cost. It's not easy. It's not always what makes us happiest. But when we put the needs of others at the forefront of our thought, God's love is shown without us ever needing to mention God's name. Isn't that the beauty of this story? That God is still present when the world is falling apart and all of the plans have unraveled. That God's love is what shines through brighter than anything else. And we get to be mirrors reflecting that love. We get to be the ones showing that love, caring for those in need. Friends, this is my challenge to you this day. It's not easy to love others sacrificially, especially in times like these. It's not easy to care for others when our own heart is breaking. But that's where God's love and light shines brightest. Praise be to God for loving us in our brokenness. Praise be to God for using us to share that love with this broken world. Join me now in prayer. Holy God, hear our intercessions. For those who are giving birth alone, for those who are grieving without their people, for the beleaguered parents who ran out of creative ideas two weeks ago, for those who don't know where this week's grocery money will come from, for everyone who has watched the date of their wedding or their graduation or their birthday or their dissertation defense or their long hoped for vacation or their family reunion or the non-essential medical procedure they hoped would change their life, come and go. For the exhausted and despairing, I ask that your comfort, your presence, and your peace be felt. And if that's not possible, could you just nudge the right person to reach out and call them? Just that, Lord. Just that. Holy God, hear my praise for the animals who get to have their people home all day, for a slow enough life that allows for baking and a garden and the use of cloth napkins, for the comfort of sweatpants, for the burst of creativity that keep coming from artists and musicians and writers, for the journalists who just keep going so we can be informed. For the gratitude shown for health workers and grocery store cashiers and delivery people. For the kindness of community providing food and resources to be dispersed right here in our community. For toilet paper on shelves and workers to wipe down our carts. For those who make masks and for those who share them. For the things I no longer take for granted and give you thanks. We pray all of these things in the name of your son who taught us to pray together, say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
friends, as you leave this place, as you leave whatever comfort it is you watch this worship service from, I challenge you to think about what it means to love your neighbor sacrificially, what it means to care for others who do not have a voice. May we recognize the ways that we've been gifted with the ability to care for others. May we recognize the ways in which we fall short of caring for others. And may we, by gathering in this space today, be changed so that we see our neighbor as being our brother and sister, so that we are moved to compassion, to care, and love them. In the name of our Father, and Son, and the Holy Spirit, Go now to love and serve the Lord. Amen.